Welcome to Fail It Forward, lessons for life, leadership, and turning failure into success. In this episode, we have Diana Naya. Diana is a motivational speaker. She's an author. She's also a world-renowned long-distance swimmer. Back in the 1970s, Diana set many records in terms of her long-distance swimming. And then it was back in 2013, when she was 64 years old, that she accomplished what was described as an impossible task, a journey that led her from the shores of Cuba to the beaches of Florida. In this journey that stretched over a hundred miles that took over two, two days, two and a half days to complete, she swam through currents, jellyfish, sharks, weather, all sorts of things that could have prohibited her from being able to finish this historic journey. And yet, as the title of her memoir says, she was able to find a way. And so we're excited to have a conversation about how Diana, despite having failed four times at this journey, finally found a way to get it done. She overcame failure to find success. Let's jump into our conversation with Diana Nyad. Hello, Diana. Welcome to the Fail It Forward podcast. We are so excited to have you here. Uh, your story is one that is so inspirational. Tell us a little bit about how you got started swimming and how swimming led to you finding out who you are as a person. You know, I'm not trying to deny that I have been a swimmer. <laughs> I, I have been, and I did, did millions and millions of strokes to cross a lot of oceans. But you know what? It's, it's not about a passion for swimming. It's not about even a fulfillment of a talent, which I do have as a swimmer, it's much more about reaching one's potential and diving into adventures. You know, when you talk about fail it forward, diving into ventures that are probably impossible. So, you know, I think since the Greeks, uh, you know, we've been discussing the whole, the template of, is it about the journey or is it about the destination? And this Cuba swim sort of full filled in spades a number of different uh, never, ever give up. It takes a team. It's not a, it looks very solitary, but it takes a team. Um, you know, you can still dream at any age. I tried this first when I was 28. I finished it finally after five death-defying attempts when I was 64. So there, there are lots of kernels of non-swimming, you know, sort of a, sort of uh, themes that flow in and out. But I'd say I actually, which, which matches what you're talking about, John, and what your podcast is all about, what it matches more than anything was that each of these four attempts, I did almost die on the box jellyfish one. I don't wish that on my worst enemy, that box jellyfish little guy. Um, but the journey each time without the destination, Nowhere close to the beach in Key West, out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, trying our hearts out, trained like no other swimmers ever trained. Those journeys were thrilling. They were filled with, you know, with knowledge, with science, with, uh, with um, the, 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 the source of the uh, human spirit. They were, they were a team that we will always be tight, this team, for the rest of our lives. It was a grand adventure. And each time, the journey brought us on a steep learning curve of what could we do next time. Even if the destination was never to be had, there was a kid in Brooklyn. I went to a, 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 a cool little elementary school when I was finally finished with it. 2013, and it was uh, first through eighth, eighth grades, actually. And each school, each class had one kid who came up to ask a question at the assembly. And in third grade, it was Joaquin. And Joaquin came up and he said, well, if you didn't make it this last time, the fifth time, would you have kept trying it over and over again? And I said, Joaquin, it was all about the journey. Even if I had never made it, the, our team was just filled with discovery. And you know what we had? We had the courage to fail. Uh -huh. and, and so that, that sort of gloves exactly to what you're talking about in Fail It Forward. 
Yeah, let, let's stay on the journey for just a second because I think there's so much power in that, and especially for people that haven't quite got to the place to where they can see the light in the end of the tunnel. And so for those folks that in, in, in your case are still out in the middle of the ocean and they're, they're working hard to make that next stroke, they're dodging jellyfishes and sharks, whatever that means in their world, what would you say to them as they're in the midst of this journey and it's really, really hard? You know, I guess, um, you know, we could talk about, you know, from the ridiculous to the sublime in terms of people are battling illnesses. I mean, not, not to even mention COVID, uh, but people are battling cancer and all kinds of things. And who am I to say, uh, you know, it, it's, all about, it's all about the journey. You know, that's not such an adventuresome life fulfilling, you know, moment, it, it's survival. But but nevertheless, I do think that the old Teddy Roosevelt, you know, tired old quote, uh, you know, to paraphrase it is, you, you over there, you go ahead and sit in your comfortable armchair, and you be the critic, and you be the spectator. And let's applaud the guy who gets in the ring and gets knocked flat down, really paraphrasing now, gets knocked flat down and gets up, gets knocked down again and gets up and gets up. That's the guy I want to be. And so I guess I'm saying that to all of us. When you get knocked down, yeah, you can, you're allowed to feel disappointment. You're allowed to fear, you know, the, 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 the down moment of failure. But do you gather yourself? Do you find your resilience and your true grit? Resilience has become the word of our times. You know, it's the pandemic word. Are you resilient? Can you remake yourself? Can you remake your company? Can you can you reinvent your family? Can you reinvent your daily values and get up and not only survive this pandemic, but thrive through it? So um, I think that's, you know, anybody who's in the middle of a fight, whether it's, uh, you know, really serious, and I'm not going to compare myself to war or, you know, to terminal illness or, you know, that ill. but if you're if you're in a fight to save something or to get somewhere that's meaningful to you, you just get smart. You surround yourself with a great team. Knowledge is power. You get to know every little nook and cranny of the issue, and you have dedication. And you get up early, and you stay up late, and you don't get there. You get knocked down. You get back up, and you put it all together again. But better this time, you get on that learning curve and you one day you make it, you make it to your other shore, whatever it is. Yeah, and in that journey, uh, and I've heard you talk about this in some of your other interviews and things, in that journey, there is a process to where you are becoming. Uh, you're, you're becoming uh, who you're meant to be. You're becoming who you want to be. Talk a little bit about that journey a little bit for people in terms of identifying and appreciating the whole process of becoming. Yeah, I think becoming, and by the way, I'll just say right away that I, I am not of the camp of things are meant to be, and okay. we are all meant to be. It's just, uh, I'm an atheist and I don't go down that road, but you used another phrase in there to say wh who you want to be. Yeah. So uh, let, let's, if you don't mind, let's work with that rather than who you're meant to be. Okay. But, um, you know, I think that, um, all of us. Uh, I, I've been lucky, John, in my life. I've uh, I've traveled the wide world. Sometimes I look at the globe. Not in this last year. I've been home, but but most of my adult life, I've been traveling into the interior of Borneo, uh, into the you know the depths of Antarctic oceans, etc. And most people I meet, they're interested in their potential. They're interested in 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 discovering who they are and what they can be. And when we want to evolve, you know, clearly we can't be comfortable. You know, clearly if you want to take a next step of, well, am, am I really this person? Do I just want to sit back in, in my easy armchair and be comfortable and never lift a finger and open an eye toward what's out there for me and what's inside here for me? Well, I, I think most of us, I think it's part of the human condition that we like to experiment. We like to be pushed. We like to push ourselves. So, um, you know, I do think that becoming, you don't even know in the beginning. You don't know what the definition of that is. And as you, 
as you move along, you say, wait a second, I, I, I didn't realize that, uh, you know, that I had a, a side of me that, that I'm, 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 I'm interested in, I'm intrigued by. I would be proud to be more of this. And, and I need to be more of this to get to where I'm going. So the, the state of discovery can be uncomfortable and we all like comfort. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, painting some picture of a 24 seven, my being, blah, you know, I, I have some moments of comfort, which I, which I very much enjoy and admit to, but as a general rule, I'm always got my eyes open, like, Oh, see that guy. Um, look, look how he, look how he goes about that. I, 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 I've never done things that way before. I'm going to, I'm going to edge myself over toward the way he's going about his life now. You, you, you have a spirit that obviously is, is boundless at some level, which is really inspirational. Talk a little bit about, is that something that is a natural gift or is that something that people can develop in terms of seeking to explore and working to explore things that are beyond what they think they have the capacity to do? Yeah, it's always an interesting question, isn't it? Nature, nurture. Like, you know, I have friends who have children um, who will say to me, um, hey, Diane, I wanted you to meet my, my 45-year-old son, Jeff, here. Jeff, and, and you know what? When he was 18 months old in his little playpen, he was exactly that guy that you meet today. He was he was restive. He was always on the move. He always had his eyes open. He was looking around. Oh, but I want you to meet my other son, uh, Daniel, who's 42 years old. When he was in that same playpen when he was 18, he was passive. He was bucolic. He was anything goes, nothing's going to rattle me, bother me. And look at them today. They are those people. So, you know, we could talk to sociologists and anthropologists as to you know, do we become the people we are as we get older or were we just born that way? And I suppose it's a, it's a combination of both. But I know for me, and I'm just lucky, I was born with a lot of energy. I, I don't have to summon myself. I don't have to say today, oh, come on, you're dragging. Yeah, come on, you better, you better you know, pump up. You better play, play rebelly on the bugle so you can wake yourself up and get to it. I just... Um, and, you know, it's annoying, you know, for friends and people close to me, they say, you know, could we possibly just take a day where we play Scrabble and look out at the horizon? Couldn't we take one lousy day? And I guess I just can't. And it's annoying to be around. But I just, um, you know, John, I wrote a, I'm nothing special. I find people I mentioned before, I've gotten lucky and traveled all around the world. And you find you know, eccentric personalities and extraordinary human beings uh, uh, among the poor, you know, among the disadvantaged. You find, you find, you know, wonderful brains and personalities everywhere. On the, Seven billion people on the planet. You find them everywhere. But I was uh, in a fifth grade class, okay, so you're 10. And the teacher said, okay, the essay, you got to come in tomorrow with an essay that just titled, What I Want to Do with the Rest of My Life. So you're 10. So I said to my mom, I never got to know any of my grandparents. You know, um, how old were they when they died? And she said, well, it's hard to figure because these circumstances. But I'd say they were mostly in their early 80s, as they say. So my essay was all about, I only have 70 years left. Look what I've done with the first 10. I've wasted a lot of time doing this and this. And I better get down to it. And it was all filled with childish things of, you know, I want to be a doctor and I want to save the world and I want to, you know, but mostly the gist of it was already at age 10, when most, most kids can't even imagine being 11, I was thinking the clock is ticking, tempest fugit. I better get busy. I better not waste a moment. I better go to bed every night saying, wow, I just couldn't do any more with that day, could I? So I, I don't know why. I, I, I can't assign it, honestly, but, but I... One one lucky thing for me, I feel it's lucky, is that I have a, as you use the word, a a boundless energy, and I'm I'm uh, I'm happy to be in the middle, in the throes of it. <laughs> I really am. <laughs> so as you as you tackle things that are obviously they're difficult feats, they're not easy. Not everyone can take those on, and yet your ambition and your spirit calls you there. And as people tell you, that's impossible. Or people say, you can't do that. 
How, how do you react to that? How, how do you deal with folks that, that doubt uh, what, what you feel called and inspired to do? You know what, John? Um, you know, people have asked me that, you know, clearly all the time about the Cuba swim when it became just stamped an impossible event for any, any great swimmer, any age, any gender, any era, nobody was going to make it across just the number of obstacles to try to get right in a three or four day period are just mathematically close to impossible. And that's why the great swimmers since 1950 had been trying, including me, and not making it across. Um, but I'll tell you the truth. I, I, I hate to put it this way, but I think I have... Um, you know, what you might call a, uh, a lack of respect for the limitations that society has put upon us. What, I'm 71 today. So, you know, I don't know what that means. All I can do is feel what I feel, get out of bed and flex my muscles and go on to another day. Um, and I don't know if I'll live to be my mother's age, 82, or if I'll go to 102. All I know is um, I don't pretend to be anything that I'm not. I'm 71, but I don't listen to, um, you know, the, um, the 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 health records and the insurance companies as to what should 71 feel like and and act like and uh, you know and behave like. I uh, so when when people would come to me to say you can't do this thing, look at you couldn't do it at the age of 28 when you were in your prime. What in the world makes you think you could do this in your 60s? It just, uh, don't you know, here, here, here's the list of, of challenges out there. You not only won't make it, you could die doing it. Well, who are those people? Who, who set those limitations? What are, what's their thinking all about? Not something I admire, <clears throat> not something I look up to and, and take in and, and, you know, really decide to process because they're, they're you know, they're so uh, erudite, you know, about the subject or about life itself. I, I'm going to set my own limitations. I'm going to look in the mirror and say, yep, you are 71. There's just, there's no getting around it. You are. And on the other hand, who's going to tell me I can't, I can't do this, that, this, that. And on the other hand, I've had I've, I've, many things in my life, a PhD recently, the screenplay of my life, that movie is, is getting made now. And Annette Benning is playing me. Talk about looking pretty good. Uh, I'll never look, I personally look that good. So uh, I'm honored about that. But I gave up the screenplay. I don't give things up. But, but, but I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid to fail. I'm not a screenwriter. I'm a writer. And I have a good imagination. And I, I started in writing the screenplay. I got paid for it. And after six months, I called the producer and said, I don't know what the point is here. Am I supposed to become a screenwriter because I don't want to be? That's not the field I want to be in. And so I would have to spend three or four years to sort of study this craft. Or do we want to get this movie made and have people be inspired by it? And he said, I've been waiting for you to make this call. So he had the respect and the production team had the respect to give me the chance to write it. And I had the my own, you know, sort of analysis as to whether it was going well and whether I should be doing this or not. And I gave it up and I haven't looked back since. So I, I, I think the idea is when you say, when people say you can't do that, you know, I, I, don't, I don't take it too seriously because I don't know who the hell those people are. Sure. I decide what my limitations are. Yeah. So you mentioned that you're a writer and you wrote a memoir called Find a Way. Talk a little bit about how that became the title and what, what the lesson is for folks uh, that are, are, are thinking and struggling with finding a way today. Yeah. You know, it's funny you say that because, you know, everybody who writes a book and uh, have you written books? I'm sure you have. I've done a little bit of writing. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm sure you have. So, you know, the title and the, you know, the cover and, you know, there are all these discussions and I didn't want Find a Way. It, it sounded to me more like a self-help book. And this is truly a memoir. I wanted to use Mary Oliver's phrase, one wild and precious life. But um, I won out on so many other things uh, for the memoir and was respected by Knopf that when they were just so sure that Find a Way was a better, relatable you know, a topic to to many more people. I went with it, and and uh, I do miss calling it one wild and precious life. Uh, in all tribute to Mary Oliver and her genius, but find a way. It sort of um, it sort of hones in on that universality 
Uh, those people standing on that beach, they were screaming and crying when I finished. A few thousand people in Key West. It's not easy to get a few thousand people in Key West. They came from all over. There were 25 million people who followed that swim, social media. Most of them were not sports fans, swimming fans, my fans. They wanted to witness for their own lives and their own predicaments, a person and a team who refused to give up and somehow found a way. When I stood on the shore, the title came from actually on the fifth time looking out at that horizon, which never looked that far away before. <laughs> I mean, the horizon's always where it is, but that day it looked like it was a million miles away. And Bonnie, my head handler, she was really became the, the leader of the expedition. And she's my partner in all things. She came close and she shook my shoulders and she said, let's find a way. And every stroke, every hour, every shark sighting, every jellyfish sting, every storm that came in, the tropics have 60 mile an hour storms that come in with a two minute warning. Literally the boats could get separated and they'd never find me again. Every minute of that swim, we found a way to make the next minute. And the next minute, that includes me internally, because you know you're in this state of sensory deprivation. You don't see anything, you don't hear anything. You're just like, if you and I just decided to sit here for 53 hours, just you sit at your microphone and I sit at mine, 53 hours, and we can't go to sleep. Okay, you can have a little sip of drink and a little something to eat here, but we're not gonna talk. We're just gonna sit here. Believe me, your mind is gonna go out and woo, the light, fantastic. So it's up to me to keep my mind together and keep my body together. And it's up to the crew, Bonnie and the crew, to keep me safe and keep us navigating toward our direction. Uh, so we found our way. And I think that's what people feel when they when they hear that phrase. You know, I, I don't care whether you're you're listening to Dr. Fauci, you know, report on you know, what's going on with the vaccinations, but he uses that phrase. He says, you know, we had to find a way through this pandemic. We're not at the end yet, but we are, we are finding our way through it. So as you reflect back on that swim, for you personally, was, was that more, and really we're, we're reflecting back on five swims, right? Because uh, yeah. it, was, it was the fifth one, I think, if I understand it right, where yeah. you finally made it from Cuba to Florida. And as you think back on that, was, was that more of a physical accomplishment or a mental accomplishment or something else for you? What, what was the true sense of accomplishment that you finally experienced personally uh, after completing that historic journey? Well, that, that question is really um, beautifully put because we could spend time on the first two thirds of it. Was it physical? Was it mental? When you're in the water. Yeah. Um, and of course, that counts all the long hours of grueling training. You know, that this sport is, I, I respect all sports, but this sport, John, this could bring you to your knees. You're out 12 hours one day in a raging sea. That night, you're not in shape yet. You're lying on the bathroom floor in the fetal position. You can't get up to eat dinner, but the next day you do get up and you go out and you do 13 hours. So the, the lonely difficult physical hours, you know, are, are rough in this sport. So we could talk about, is that more physical or is that more mental? And they, and they wind up like in most sports being quite equal. But I like the third part of your question, which is, or was it something even beyond all of that? And it was. The earth is something like four fifths water, maybe more seven eighths water. So you could ostensibly, except in you know way too cold waters of the Arctic and Antarctic, you could pick hundreds of thousands of hundred mile swims out in the middle of the Pacific, or you know from from the coast of Japan to the coast of something. But this swim was to me, it was the emblem of my potential. And, and it was in my heart, soul, since I was a kid. I grew up down there close to Miami. The Cuban Revolution happened. I had all of a sudden Cuban friends. We were dancing salsa in their backyards. And I was enthralled with that forbidden island right off our coast. So from a child, age nine, Cuban Revolution happened for me. 
um, I was buzzing with not the English Channel and not the Catalina Island Swim and not the Manhattan Island Swim. I did some of those. I held the records for some of those, but I was fascinated with this Cuba thing. And because it was so maybe impossible, maybe you'd have to have the courage to fail to even try this thing. Um, I looked at it as not another sporting event, not another notch in the endurance belt. I had plenty of those. I looked at it as, do I have the true grit to, to, to be smart and to get ready and to try this thing, to discover who I am in, in the effort of trying it? So that that's really what it was all about. And I think, again, to use that word universality, I think that's what appealed to people about my story, this particular Cuba story. It wasn't the nuts and bolts of the sport. It was the spirit of trying something that you would have to touch down into every fiber of your being to give it a go. And the same with the entire team around you. That's what it was all about. And you know what? I'm, I'm, I've retired from swimming. Again, I keep retiring, but I do believe I'm really retired this time. But I still have that spirit. I still have that, that desire. And I remind myself with the Cuba swim, not just to look back and sit around eating bonbons all day, watching, saying, oh, isn't that great? Remember the day I, I was triumphant? And it's because I want to remember the true grit. I want to remember the courage to fail. I want to remember that to, no matter what I'm trying to do, to just never, ever give up and get there. I, I want the spirit of what the Cuba Swim was more than the sport itself, you know? Yeah, one of the things you mentioned, kind of the uniqueness of your sport. And one of the things that I think is so unique about it that is so rare is the vulnerability that you have to place yourself in in terms of being able to accomplish it. I mean, you, you described it in terms of being in the middle of the ocean where you're dealing with currents, you're dealing with weather, you're dealing with jellyfish, sharks, fatigue, dehydrate, all that kind of stuff that's going on around you. Uh, talk a little bit about, it, it's really similar to people that anytime you wanna pursue your dream, there is a level of vulnerability that you're going to have to allow in order to be able to do it. Part of that vulnerability is you might fail. You might embarrass yourself uh, in, in pursuing it. Talk to people a little bit about how did you deal with the, the vulnerability? Yeah, it's, it's a good, I've never used that word um, with this venture, but uh, it's a good word. But you know, let's take an extreme example. And right now I'm gonna be embarrassed because I'm, I bet you'll help me. I'm searching for his last name, but Alex, who climbed El Capitan and oh, the- uh, yeah, Free Solo. Uh, free Solo. Free solo. Alex. Alex. Anyway. It? Arnold? Alex? Arnold? Oh, Honald. Honald. Honald? Yeah, yeah. There we go. Alex. Oh. Well, and by the way, the, the, the directors of Free Solo are directing this feature film with oh. Annette Benning on me. So, you know, that's a pretty great combination. But when you see that footage of Alex- and there's nobody, there's no team out there to help him. At some points, literally, not his entire finger, but the first digit of his finger is holding on to the edge of a rock, thousands of feet up in the air. Forget about it. <laughs> uh, not me. Now, you know, so talk about vulnerability, but he can't be engaged in that. He does all the intense preparation of the, of the shall we say, the, the surface of that rock. And he climbs parts of it and he takes in detailed photographs of it and he gets his body, including his little digits ready for it. Well, the, um, you know, the, the, the talk about vulnerability. And yes, I'm on the surface of an ocean where, you know, all kinds of animals and, you know, all kinds of uh, 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 huge ocean currents and tides and weather, you know, you, you're very vulnerable. But once you get out there, you can't be involved in all that. You're a professional and you've developed a team. It's just like a driver at the Indianapolis 500, you know, might be going 100 miles an hour around a hairpin turn. He's not scared. She's not scared. They prepared and they could die. They could, people do, they die at the Indianapolis 500. But um, they're not in that. They're not feeling that vulnerability while they're there. So if I were on every stroke, 
thinking that I see a shark's fin because a cloud went over and cast a dark shadow, you know, over to this side, especially in this sense of duress and sensory deprivation, we'd be lost. I would just be in a, in a state of panic every single minute. So I, I, can't, I can't afford to feel vulnerable, and I don't. You know, when I'm out there in the ocean, I've decided that that professional team, those shark divers, along with the electric current that we have flowing under me that deters the sharks from coming in, the greatest, uh, the top box jellyfish expert in the world, Dr. Angel Yanagihara, leading that faction of the team, knowing what sort of a glycogen deprivation I'm going to be under. I just... I just, uh, you know, you can't go there. You're, you're, you're not, you're not the right person for this venture if you're going to allow any of that vulnerability to come to the surface, so to speak. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I've got one last question for you, and, and I okay. want to uh, switch roles with Bonnie for just a second. Uh, okay. But go back and imagine with me that moment where Bonnie spoke into you in terms of saying, let's find a way. Where you're standing on that beach in Cuba or wherever it was to where you were about ready to launch this journey. And imagine for a second that you're Bonnie and in front of you is someone that is in their own story and in their own life is getting ready to launch a journey. Uh, as, as you grab their shoulders and look into their eyes, uh, what, what is the message that you have for them in terms of how is it that they're going to accomplish their impossible? Yeah, you know, it's funny, uh, when we were on the Cuban shore, all five times, way back to 1978 and up, I gave a speech to my team, and, uh, and Bonnie could well, I, I like you positioning it this way, Bonnie could well have given me that speech. Huh. And basically what I said to the team was, look, we all know, and we've learned the hard way, that mother nature is raging on steroids out there. This is not some easy crossing. Um, there's danger to it. And, and there's a likelihood that something will come up just like a climber going up K2 or Annapurna or Mount Everest. If a hundred mile an hour wind comes in, you don't say I've got the willpower to go against that. No, you hunker down in your tents or you get down to base camp is you say, this is not our day. We got to come back another day. Mother nature is superior to us. So I would say to my team, and as you position it, Bonnie could well have said to me on the shore all five times, look, a storm at 60 miles an hour might come in and might sweep us so far off course, we can't get back on course. The Gulf Stream might change its axis as we're going and screw us up and not allow us to travel north and push us east, east, east. The box jellyfish, as much as we've done to prevent it with a silicone mask and whatnot, one tentacle might seep through the neck. That's all you need. One little lousy tentacle and you're either dead or you're close to dead. Um, sharks may come and we're so afraid of a real attack that we have to pull you from the water and the swim is over. All of that might happen. We all know that. We all know the chances are slim that we're going to make it to the other side. But I'll tell you one thing that won't happen. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to raise my hand and say, I just, I bit off more than I can chew. I'm exhausted. I'm fed up. I can't do another lousy, lonely one hour of singing Neil Young to myself, you know, for, for, for this whole time. That's not going to happen. I promise you, you guys as a team, you came together and you gave it your all. You didn't get paid a cent. You gave it all your expertise, all your dedication. And if we don't make it to the other side, it will be Mother Nature that won't allow us. It'll be the universe that won't allow us. It won't be me. So I do think that's the speech that Bonnie would give me. You did everything right. You didn't leave a stone unturned. If we were doing an 18-hour swim in St. Martin, who cares if we do 17 hours that day? It's our swim. It's our training swim. But you wouldn't even leave it at 17 hours, 58 minutes when we got to the dock. You said, what? We're not at 18 hours? You went out and swam two more minutes to make it 18 hours. You did it all right. And we are going to make it. You are going to find your way to that other shore. Well, I love that because it puts the focus back on the journey, right? Instead of just keeping it yeah. on the fault. And it allows... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
for the result to take care of itself and an understanding that there are other things that'll play into whatever the result is. And that's, that's just part of it. So Diana, this yeah. has been tremendous fun. Uh, such a pleasure to have the opportunity to be in conversation with you. Thank you for uh, your energy, your enthusiasm, obviously the way that you've inspired millions of people, not only just with your swimming, but uh, with the many ways in what you're pouring into people's lives through your speaking and your writing and uh, just all of the expertise that you've acquired from the journey and your heart to help others is truly uh, an honor to have an opportunity to chat with you. So thanks for your time. Thank you, John. I've enjoyed it. I truly have. Thank you.